Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to our webinar this evening and thank you for attending, especially those of you who are members of one of our institutions. My name is Dion Rowley and I will be acting in my capacity as committee member and chair for the IET New South Wales branch by chairing tonight's event. For those of you who may not be a member of one of the institutions and would like some more information on how to join and the benefits, please feel free to contact myself directly or one of the institutions using the links at the end of this presentation. The Joint Institutions Lecture Series is a collaborative arrangement between the Institute of Engineering and Technology, Engineers Australia and the IEEE, where we work together to bring you a diverse programme of technical events and meetings to provide continuing professional development and networking opportunities. During the current restrictions, we aim to continue to bring you these events via our web-based platform until we can resume normal physical events at our new auditorium in Market Street, Sydney. Just before we start, I would like to give an acknowledgement of country. Engineers Australia and the Joint Institutions Lecture Series Committee acknowledges the traditional custodians of the country throughout Australia and recognises their continuing connection to land, waters and community. We pay our respects to them and their cultures and to elders, both past, present and emerging. For the purposes of this live presentation, all participants will be asked to mute their microphones and we encourage you all to submit any questions that you may have using the chat box provided. For those of you who may be watching this as a recording event at a later date, there will be a Q&A session at the end which will address a selection of the questions raised during the live event. Also, there will be a question and answers um, at the end of the session where you can provide feedback on the speakers and the general experience of the event and also suggest any other lectures that you may like to see in the future programmes. Tonight, we are privileged to have with us Scott Coleman, who will be talking about his innovative work to reduce injury through the development of wearable technology. Scott's primary focus is exploring various workplace injury prevention methods using innovative and comprehensive approaches based on sports science technology and mythologies. This approach evolved from the combination of over 20 years of experience working with elite athlete, athletes, primarily with Rowing Australia and Athletics Australia, with the skills developed working in private practice treating injured workers. Over the past five years, Scott has been partnering with large organisations, the Workers' Compensation Board, insurance brokers and agents to reduce the costs associated with workplace injury. At the core of Scott's work is the ability to reduce the injury risk of workers by combining sports injury prevention techniques, movement analysis using wearable technology, data analytics and the psychosocial elements specific to individuals in the workplace. Well, that's enough of me talking. I'm sure that you're here to hear Scott's great presentation. So please, if you would virtually welcome and put your hands together, in welcoming Scott Coleman to the stand. Thank you. Thanks, Dion, and thanks for the virtual applause, everybody. Um, I really appreciate your time. Um, so I do thank you for, um, for spending your time with me and, and hopefully you'll get something out of this today. Um, it's been interesting for me. I've, um, I was just the last few weeks spending a lot of time on similar webinars, a lot of health and safety, a lot of workers' compensation webinars, and so, the opportunity to present to a whole new audience is, is really exciting. Um, they're taking an engineering approach to um, workplace injury prevention is basically what we've done from day one. And the safety sphere is generally not as structured as the engineering world. And so for us to come in and, and take a new approach to this long, the, this problem has been around for a long time. Um, it makes sense that um, when we were asked to present the, to show show everyone how um, how engineering principles can be used in different different areas. So um, I'll I'll run through the slides and hopefully at the end, if you've got any questions, type them in the chat box and we'll, we'll answer them at the end. But uh, we'll we'll get into it. Um, 
So first of all, in this, in this presentation, I'll go through how we use an engineering approach to prevent workplace injury. So first of all, identifying the problem, assessing the existing solutions to the problem, and then designing and developing a new solution. And that was, that took us, that, that process there took us nearly five years. Then the trials and the reassessment and refinement is a continual, as, as everyone knows, for a, a proper solution to be sustainable, it needs to be regularly reassessed and refined. So we'll go through all of these stages in, the, um, in this webinar today. But first of all, I won't bore you all too much with the workplace injury prevention problem. However, it is a big problem and it is a problem that not many people are aware of the extent. So the cost of workplace injuries uh, reaches $18 billion a year in direct costs for, for back and shoulder injuries, but $45 billion a year in indirect costs, including management costs, production loss, and the cost of ongoing injuries. So usually if a worker sustains an injury, the likelihood of them sustaining another injury is actually quite high. So there's that ongoing cost associated with that as well. 63% of these injuries are caused by overexertion and body stressing, which are avoidable. And this is coming from my background where as a sports physio and a sports movement analyst, I was involved in sports that involved repetitive loading. They weren't contact sport. I did do a bit of time with rugby and with AFL where contact injuries are inevitable. It's part of the sport. But with sports like rowing and athletics and triathlon, their repetitive loading should not, if it's managed properly, should not cause injury. Injury is caused by mismanagement of that load. So it's the same thing in the workplace. There are accidents from time to time. People slip, trip, fall, hurt their ankles, hurt their knees. But repetitive loading injuries should be avoided if they are managed properly. So 63% of these injuries are really avoidable. 42% of these workers um, experience injuries in the office. So here we are. This is not so much the physical workers now. This is you guys, the engineers who are spending a lot of time behind the desk. So there's a lot of injuries associated with poor ergonomics in the workstation. The problem is actually getting worse over time, not getting better. So you'd think with new technology, new methods, um, new research, that the problem would be slowly, um, the cost and the incident of injuries would be going down. But as these two charts show, these, um, these charts are from Safe Work New South Wales, uh, based off the workers' compensation, workers' compensation statistics from the Australian Bureau of Statistics. And you can see in the first chart, both the compensation and the time lost are gradual, have been increasing steadily since 2004, 2005. And unfortunately, the percentage of those claims involves the older workers. So with an aging workforce, that has a pretty big impact on the, on the working population. So the existing solutions. So five years ago, when I transitioned across from sports injury prevention and sports movement analysis, into the workplace health and safety industry, the existing solution basically involved education and training methods, which research has proven are ineffective at changing worker behavior, yet they're still the predominant solution to workplace injury prevention. The existing solutions were very limited by time, resources and budget. So they relied on individual safety professionals delivering face-to-face -face training. Now, if you've got a, a work site, or if you've got a workforce of three, 4,000 people, it's not possible for that one individual or for that group to do face-to-face -face training with every single worker. Also, geographically, when workers are spread over throughout in such a big country like um, Australia, it's hard for these safety professionals to deliver these services face-to-face. -face. And unfortunately, health and safety budgets were always limited. That wasn't an item that got a lot of attention and still doesn't get a lot of attention from the executives. So the approaches that were available and still are currently used and popular are not specific to individual injury risks. So usually they involve specific safe operating procedures that all workers have to follow but don't. 
or the generic injury prevention programs that are not targeting the specific risks for the work tasks that the workers provide, uh, where the workers are conducting. So that involves safe lifting techniques, teaching people to lift boxes with their back, straight back and the, using their knees and, and their legs to generate the power. But the reality is not many people actually lift that way because usually they're lifting all different shapes and sizes of objects in all sorts of environments. So those generic programs don't address the individual injury risks, don't address the specific risks for the task the individuals are performing. And most assessments, risk assessments, are based on observation and opinion. So it involved a, 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 involved a clipboard and someone writing down their observations and their risk assessments based off their expertise. So again, it's not scalable, but it's very subjective. And again, there's research showing that the inter-rater reliability and the intra-rater reliability for those assessments is very poor because it relies on that individual's memory and perception of what's going to happen or what the risk is for that individual performing that task. So it was very, um, a lot of the injury risk assessments and the, the injury prevention programs were very um, outdated but ineffective. So I came in with my sports science, sports injury prevention um, background, which research has proven the most effective injury prevention programs occur on, in the sports medicine field. And this is due to technology, it's due to research. There are decades of research validating processes that can reduce injury risk for athletes. So transitioning those, I spent five years transitioning the methodology and the technology across to the workplace. And that's part of this process that I'm going to talk you through today, because there was a lot of trial and error. And there was a lot of areas where we had to modify what we were doing, because there are obvious differences between collecting data from athletes and protecting athletes from injury, whilst co collecting data from workers and protecting workers from injury. The population size was the biggest, obviously but also one of those items I've already mentioned, the budget. The workers generally didn't have access to the more expensive equipment and the more expensive data analysis teams that the athletes have access to. So a lot of that was, was transitioning them across in a cost-effective way and a way that was scalable to bigger populations. So sports-based injury prevention programs are based on the TRIP model, which I'll talk about on the next slide. But most importantly, the sports injury prevention models focus on measuring movement quality as well as quantity. So most workplace risk assessments just focused on how far the worker moved, how far they bent or how high they were reaching to perform a task. And they neglected the quality of the movement. Whereas in sports, we know the primary factor or the variable that is the highest predictor of injury risk for athletes across most sports is acceleration. And accelerometer data and gyroscope data over the last 10, 15 years has proven that it's a really, really powerful variable that when managed properly and when used to identify injury risks, that it, it's actually very accurate and very valid. And the, um, there was a period there where um, probably seven or eight years ago now where AFL players with their GPS device in the back of their jersey, they, they have a sport, and they still do today, they have a sports science team on the sideline with the laptop collecting all the live data. But at one stage, it got to the point where as soon as their point-to-point -point acceleration for players dropped below their personal threshold, they knew that that increased their hamstring injury risk by over 70%. So players were getting dragged based off that variable, which was, research showed it was an accurate and valid variable. However, the teams at the time were neglecting the emotion of the, of the game and, the, and the, all the other things that are involved in winning a game. So all of a sudden, this focus on injury prevention started superseding all of these other elements that are needed to win a game. So you could have a player who's just kicked three goals and is on a roll, and then they get dragged because of a number changing on a laptop on the sideline. So it's, the pendulum swung a little bit too far at one stage. It started to come back now where... The information is used as one piece of the puzzle. It's not the, the defining information that's used to drag players and rest players and send them back on. Establishing specific baselines using load. Now, load is uh, 
concept that was introduced to sports athlete um, monitoring about 10 years ago, where we were realizing that, when I say we, sports physios, sports medicine teams were realizing that there had to be a way of combining multiple variables into one, one factor that could be monitored over time. Trying to monitor all of these other things like sleep quality, hydration, fatigue levels, uh, strength levels, the data from the GPS devices, recovery, all of these sorts of things. There had to be a way of combining them all into one, one variable that can be tracked over time. And so you could see, you establish an athlete's baseline. If their load is above or below what their baseline should be, that's when you need to be mindful of what training they're gonna do next or what competitive load they're gonna be put under. So formulas were, were ex we basically tried a whole heap of different, different formulas and we found that different sports needed to focus on different variables. So that's where the sports science teams from different sports started refining their own load monitoring formulas and algorithms. So you can go to every AFL team now, or every rugby league team, and you can find that there, it's top secret, of course, I won't tell you, but they've got their own load monitoring process that involves different variables and involves different weighting on those variables. So some will say, well, a few seasons ago, we had a lot of sprinting injuries. So sprinting load is weighted higher than endurance load. Or some might say we had a lot of gym related incidents, a lot of injuries that we think were caused by the gym. So the gym load is actually weighted higher. And that's how you monitor the load of the athletes. And so this, this principle of, of monitoring load has really been shown to be effective at produ reducing injury risk for athletes. And by transitioning that into the workplace, it was basically a no brainer. It was we're still trying to educate the community, the um, health and safety industry, but this this statement is actually a really good way of, of explaining it in a simple way in that loads a process of quantifying the amount of physical training that an athlete undertakes. So in the workplace, it's the same. Load is a process of quantifying the amount of physical work that the worker undertakes using the variables relevant for their occupation. So the TRIP model, it basically involves translating research into prevention practice. And that seems quite obvious, um, but the reality is this doesn't occur in a lot of industries, in particular workplace health and safety. There's a lot of research sitting there that doesn't get actually translated into practical pro uh, injury prevention processes. So the TRIP model involves five stages or six stages, but I've circled the stages where we've focused on with um, the developing the wearable technology. So injury surveillance, the first two phases are pretty straightforward, that's, that's tracking over time, but developing preventative measures and evaluating those measures using solid data is where the sports medicine industry has been really um, effective at reducing injuries. And that's where we focused on um, taking these same principles across to, the, across to the workplace health and safety industry, focusing on that stage three and four. And that's where the industry was really lacking. So the preventative measures, you've got primary prevention, which is using task assessments and screening. So screening the workers, to identify which workers aren't physically capable of doing it in the first place. Secondary prevention, and this is where wearable technology is so valuable and so crucial. It's, it involves the early detection of the onset of symptoms, early detection of overload. And then there's tertiary prevention, which is basically the prevention of re-injury. So when you've got an injured athlete or an injured worker, you're returning them, you wanna make sure that they're resilient enough to not only withstand the tasks that they've got to do, but also that they haven't deconditioned elsewhere. And a big focus in sports uh, rehab and sports injury prevention over the past 15, 20 years has been about focusing not just on the injured body parts. So an athlete with an injured shoulder, traditionally all of the treatment, all the rehab would be on the shoulder and you'd end up with deconditioning to the rest of the body. And then the Institute of Sport did a study, I think 2008, 2007, whereby they looked at the, the incidence of re-injury 
throughout a, a season of um, that was AFL as well. So throughout throughout a season of AFL, regardless of what the first injury was the likelihood of that athlete sustaining another injury in that season to the same or a different body part was 70%. So athletes either got through this full season uninjured or they'd sustain an injury and that would then trigger this process because their training would change. So their their conditioning would change. They'd get a shoulder injury. All of a sudden they're sprinting and their upper body and their trunk conditioning would change because of the change in training load. So tertiary prevention has had a big shift over the last, in the workplace injury prevention um, and workers comp, workers rehab, there's been a big shift now because doctors understand that, that you don't have to focus just on the injured body part. You have to focus on the whole worker to make sure that there's not that risk of injury to other areas. So secondary prevention, this is where wearable technology is crucial. So you got the biological onset, which is the first phase, the detectable signs, which is the second phase. These are basically, it's impossible to get information about these phases without measuring the workers' movements and comparing them to a baseline. Those are the two phases where the biggest benefits can be made because by, by the time you get to that third phase, pain and dysfunction, an injury has occurred and the reality is it's hard to backtrack from there. Once an injury has occurred, that's when you're, tertiary prevention starts. So that secondary prevention is where most of the benefits can be made in, um, in using wearable technology. So monitoring load is not simply a matter of measuring um, range, it's about measuring control, but there's these different types of load that have been identified in the sports medicine sphere. There's the external load, which is the biomechanical, which is measuring their movements. There's internal load, which is the physiological response to that movement, that's heart rate and that's body temperature. Then there's chronic and acute load. Chronic load is over time, acute load is a short duration. So from a sports perspective, the acute load might be a chest session in the gym and it might be you've done 10 sets of 15 reps at whatever weight, that's the acute load on the athlete. The chronic load would be how that load sits throughout the whole week. So they'd have a training cycle, the training cycle would be a week, that's the chronic load and the acute load sits within there. So again, we've taken that principle to the workplace, the chronic load is a week or a roster or a, she uh, or a series of shifts or whatever it is, and the acute load is the task, the specific task they wanna, um, that they have to do throughout that shift. So the acute load, we can actually identify, get data from each of the tasks, identify the acute load, and then see how that spans over the shift, which is the chronic load. The acute chronic ratio is, has now been seen in sport as the most accurate predictor of injury risk. And that's basically the ratio of acute load over chronic load. And if it falls within every, every sports finding, they've got their own threshold, but if it falls outside of a certain threshold, the risk of injury is really high. This is something that we're going to try to uh, try to adapt to the workplace at some point, but we need a lot of data to be able to find what that what that sweet spot is for that acute chronic ratio. So calculating the load for you um, for engineers, this will probably seem a bit um, a bit not so much vague, but there's a lack of consistency. But there's a lack of consistency for a reason. These are all the different variables that sporting teams can use to measure load on their athletes. So they look at these and they'd see which ones are more or less valid, more or less reliable, which ones are practical for their um, athletes, but also which ones are relevant for the sport that they're doing. So the reason why I put this slide up is to show you how many different variables can be used to calculate load with athletes, can be used. How many different variables are used to calculate load? Here's a, um, this is from a professional rugby league team. This is a basic way that they monitored load early on using um, pretty simple measures of RPE, which is rate of perceived exertion. So that was the athlete basically saying from zero to 10, how hard was this session? 10 being the hardest, zero being nothing. So RPE time gave, gave you um, the volume of training and the total load. So that was the way they measured um, load in athletes in the off season. Um, so that's one of the ways. 
Here's another way. This actually is a more, much more complex way. This is more for endurance sports. But the purpose of this slide was to show that generally it doesn't matter as long as the variables are relevant for the sport, it doesn't matter which formula or which method is used to calculate load. They all generally show that it, it, they are a general measure of the physical demands of what the athlete has to undertake. And as long as it's consistent, as long as you stick with whatever way you're using to calculate load, then it can be used as a reference point and used to manage that load to prevent injuries. So acute chronic ratio, as I said before, there's this, and this, this um, chart has actually been proven to be very um, accurate and very transferable across multiple sports. There's this sweet spot where the injury risk is really low. And that's where that acute chronic ratio is so valuable. The danger zone is, um, and again, it's not just a matter of reducing the load. It's a matter of that acute chronic ratio being enough, a good proportion of acute loading over the chronic loading. It's not just a matter of reducing. If you remove all the, um, as it shows with the circle, if you remove all the acute loading, then it's not just a matter of re reduce the acute loading, reduce the injury risk. That's not the case. So it's about getting that balance because, again, they get deconditioned. If you take away certain work tasks throughout a shift, then the workers become deconditioned. And then if there's an increase in demand or for whatever reason, there's a um, breakdown in equipment and they need to do physical work again, then their injury risk is really high. So a lot of that was the background behind the problem and the existing solutions. Now we're going to go into what we did to try to solve it and how we did it in a practical and successful way. So our new solution had to be easy to use in the health and safety space, had to be easy to understand. I learned early on that just transitioning a lot of that sports science information across to the workplace just was lost. Some of those early projects that I did, people were basically glazing over and they, were, they, they missed completely the, um, the point of the data and the value in the data. So it had to be easy to understand had to be engaging for the workers. So again, a lot of the previous injury prevention programs and solutions didn't engage the workers. They were programs that were designed by safety professionals or managers, and they didn't engage the workers at all. As a result, the workers wouldn't respond, they wouldn't pay attention, they wouldn't actually change their behavior because you could imagine if a worker has been doing a job for 20 or 30 years, and in comes a 22 year old female, a uh, physio who's never lifted a box or never done the work task in her life, and she's going to be telling this worker how to do his job safer. There's no engagement there, and straight away there's, it's a waste of money and, and it's going to be ineffective. So the project, the, the solution had to be engaging for the workers, and using sport as that engagement process was really, we found it struck a chord. Most blue collar workers, physical workers, they love their sport. They love sport, beer, and their family and friends. And so we're tying into the sport. We couldn't give away free beer, unfortunately, with our sensors when we were trying to collect data, but we did tie it into sporting stories and, and basically saying that the sensors that they're using are the exact same sensors that are used for their athletes, the, the heroes that they watch on the weekend play um, for the AFL or the rugby league or, or whatever their sport is, the netball for the women. And, and um, straight away that engaged them to know that, uh, to make them feel special, knowing that, the same injury prevention process for the professional athletes is now going to be applied to them. So that, that was a good conversation starter for a lot of the workers, but it had to be cost effective. Um, like I said, health and safety budgets are limited, so it had to be scalable and cost effective. So here is a lot of the technology that was available that wasn't cost effective. So we trialed it and in the end, it wouldn't um, fit into a sustainable solution. So calculating the load in the workplace, it had to be practical and useful. Here's, here's one solution that was um, that we came across early on. And while collecting data is one thing, making it cumbersome and, um, and not practical for the worker was, was another thing altogether. So we came across a, a couple of funny, um, funny attempts in the past. You use wearable technology to, to prevent workplace injury. So we knew we had to, had to put something together that was not going to impede on the worker and be transferable across to um, normal operations. So 
we had the, the measuring, there was measuring internal load and external load were both factors that we wanted to focus on. So internal load, physiological load, RPM wellness questionnaires, we found pretty early on, there's a lot of other factors that can influence those. So you could ask a worker, how was that task on a scale of naught to 10, 10 being the most physically demanding you could imagine and zero being nothing. Straight away, they're gonna think, well, what should I say to impress my boss? Or what should I say in this environment if I wanna get a day off? So there were a lot of other, um, a lot of factors that was influencing the RPE and the questionnaires. So while they're still used, they're not very um, valid, that's for sure. Heart rate, galvanic skin resistance. So heart rate, oh, that's an obvious one. We found early on workers didn't like having their heart rate measured because it was a direct indicator of how hard they were working. Or they perceived that their employer would see how high their heart rate was or how low their heart rate was and see that as a direct indicator of how hard they were working. So a lot of workers pushed back on the heart rate and galvanic skin resistance that we tried that early on. That's a measure of stress response. So it measures your, the activity of your sweat glands and that's a direct correlation with your sympathetic nervous system activity or your flight, fight or flight system. So we did try that early on to measure stress response in high, highly stressful situations and environments. But again, uh, a lot of workers found it a little bit too intrusive and a little bit too, um, a little bit too concerning from a privacy perspective. Temperature as well, to measure temperature that was correlated with heart rate as well. They perceived that as a, as a way of their employer seeing how hard they were working. VO2 and blood lactate were never practical. They were, they're used a lot and they're very um, valid and accurate measures of not just physical exertion, but recovery, but doing bloods and, and measure VO2 is, is gas analysis, breathing gum gas analysis to see basically how hard they're working. And um, that wasn't practical at all. External load, however, was. You could easily measure time and duration. Accelerometry, there's accelerometers everywhere in your phone. So a couple of small accelerometers to measure movement, very easy to do. GPS, there was again, a bit of pushback from workers there because they were, there was a sense of being tracked which is fair enough. Like the reality is they can be tracked wherever they are. So that's where the workers were generally happy to have data collected from the movements that they were performing whilst doing their tasks throughout a shift. But when it came to GPS tracking, there was a, a hesitation to um, wear GPS devices so that they, um, they still had their sense of privacy. So that in, on, in their breaks, they weren't being tracked. Force dynamometry and power. Early on, we measured power. We measured the amount of force required to do tasks. But the reality is you could get 10 workers, you could measure the amount of force they, were, they needed to generate to perform a task. And it was all the same, even though they would move differently. So we found it wasn't necessarily measuring the force required to do a task. It was more measuring the way the workers moved to generate that force. So that's where we generally focused on time and accelerometry. That's where we got the most value from all the data we collected and that's gave us the better, best indication of which workers were a higher injury risk than others. The wearable tech, uh, first of all, we had to work out which wearable tech in particular was accurate and reliable. Now, most people think they put on an Apple watch or they put on a Fitbit and what that information is providing them is 100% accurate. If they've done 500, if it says 500 steps, then you can assume that that is 500 steps. But this chart shows that a lot of the Apple Watch isn't on there, but a lot of the popular wrist-worn activity monitors actually have at least 10% of, um, of error in, in their measurements. Obviously not time, but in a lot of their measurements, there is that error all the way up to Basis band aren't around anymore. Um, it's not surprising given that there was what 24% error in their data. But the Nike one, direct, so all those activity monitors, um, there is generally 10% error in them. So we factored that into the, the equations as we started using accelerometers and we started using the different devices. And that's when we started, and rather than relying on commercially available devices, we started making our own. So the trials, we started with a relatively ugly, hideous um, device, which 
looks more like a high school science experiment, but that's where you start. You start with whatever you can put together and that's where you get feedback from the workers. You get, you get the data, you work out what is valuable and what is not valuable. And we ended up with something that was a little bit more commercially attractive, uh, smaller, easier to use, connecting to the worker's smartphone, which is an interesting one because Going back to that point earlier, having to engage the workers, uh, the first lot of trials, the, the sensors measured the workers' movements, but then that data was sent to the dashboard that the employer had access to. And the worker had access to their data through the dashboard. But the work, there was this perception that the workers had these sensors on and that data is going straight to their boss. So we, we wanted to, and we asked them, we said, well, what, how can we change that? How can we engage them more? And, we suggested that having the data from the sensors go to their smartphone and the app on the smartphone is signed, they're signed into their account. It gave them that sense of ownership and they could de-identify the data if they wanted to, but they actually had that sense of control because it was through their phone or through their account. It didn't have to be their phone, but it was through their Preventure account that then the data was then sent to the employer of the dashboard. So that's how we refined it. We're basically, I'll show you the sensors. That's that's what we ended up with. So rather than the big harness you can see on the top picture there, we had just this simple clip that goes over the collar and sits on the upper back. Now that sits in that same position that rugby league, AFL, basketball, most athletes have a sensor there. So that's the second most validated wearable technology position. The most validated is the wrist, of course. Um, so rather than trying to revalidate a position higher up on the collar or somewhere else on the body, we just went with the, um, the position that has been used for, for nearly 20 years now. Um, but we can also use the, the data, the algorithms for that position for, for steps and for running and for lower limb impacts and all the other things are used in sports. And the other sensor basically just goes around the upper arm because that one obviously can't measure shoulder injury risk. And we know that shoulder injury risk is actually the second highest injury risk to lower back. So the other sensor just wraps around the upper arm like that. Um, and by making it as easy and cost effective as possible, we, um, we ended up reducing the burden for the workers. So while refining it down and making it simpler, it actually made it easier for the workers to fit and to use. So charging, all that sort of thing, connecting to the smartphone was a whole lot easier than our early, um, our early prototypes. So the first things we started to discover was how the time, I mean, it was, it was basic stuff. We just wanted to see how the time was distributed throughout a shift, who was doing what and when, and how can that be used to reduce injury risk? So all that came back to was measuring workers' movements and looking at how much time was spent doing certain movements. Uh, so this is the first sort of valuable insight we found that would make a difference for, for, this, so for this particular occupation. They were cleaning rooms. So we just thought, well, there are certain tasks that load the back more than the shoulder. So why not alternate the high load back tasks, which you can see in the chart have a big blue column, with some of the ones with the more load on the shoulder. So your back gets a rest between. But as you can see, the task number, the first, what, five tasks in cleaning a room were all very heavy loading on the back. So if you replace task eight and nine with two and four, then it was distributing the load a little bit more evenly. They'd do a task that was high load on their back, then they'd do a task that's high load on their arm, and they would alternate that way, and that, that managed to reduce their injury risk. This was an interesting one, task repetition at a um, manufacturing plant, food manufacturing. They were rotating tasks just randomly in a way that they'd always done. Um, and their rostering was basically in a way that was already done. So if we measured, again, we measured the, um, the last one, we measured the, the cycle of cleaning a room, which was 50 minutes from memory. Here, we measured data throughout a full shift. And as you can see, from 8 till 9 a.m., where those, uh, the blue and the orange column are, and then again, from I think 11 till 12, there was a lot of tasks that involved a lot of physical work, but then throughout the shift, there was a lot less physical work. So we then went back and said, all right, so these tasks, why are these tasks all done in a row? Why aren't these tasks broken down and separated by the tasks that were done in the afternoon? And 
there was no reason for it. It was just a matter of the way they'd always done it. So the first hour of a shift was always very physically demanding. And then again, after their um, their first smoko break, their first morning tea break, uh, the next hour was very physically demanding. Um, and so we just broke it down. We just said, here are the tasks that are physically demanding. Here are the tasks that aren't. Let's interchange them so that the rotations give the muscles and the body a chance to recover between tasks. But again, it came from measuring data from a long period and then refining it to see where the load was and managing that load. This is an interesting one, different equipment. So it was a um, equipment, menu, uh, equipment servicing company. Um, the workers were allowed to use whatever tool bag they want. So each tool bag we found, this wasn't a, a goal of the project. This was just something we picked up when we're going through the data. We were trying to work out why certain workers were moving differently as they were carrying their tools to the task. Because usually they'd park in a car park and then they'd have to carry the tools for up to 30 minutes to actually get to the job. So carrying the tools with the tool bag actually increased the load on their back. So you can see two different bags. The one with the red line is a much higher load than the one on the blue line. The one on the blue line, you got that initial peak where they grab the bag, but it was quite low throughout after that. So that's where these recommendations went back to the workers. And rather than the employer saying, you all need to choose this bag now, they said, here is the different options. These are the bags we measured. This one has these risks. This one has these risks. You can choose. And they ended up choosing the one with the lowest risk anyway. Here's another one comparing different equipment. So this was a different, this was an interesting one from an engineering perspective. They wanted to install these vacuum lifters where it's a vacuum, a vacuum suction device that helped take, remove the vertical weight of the bag. So what happened, Safe Work provided a, a notice that they wanted to test all the different options. And so when we collected data per bag, you can see the blue line was the load without the lifter. So that was where they just grabbed a bag and threw it on the trolley. But the orange line was the load with the lifter. So you can see the peak is quite lower, as significantly lower. So the physical demands of using the vacuum lifter was lower, but the task took nearly twice as long. That meant that between bags, there was less recovery time for these their baggage handlers, rather than just grabbing the bag and throwing it and then having a bit of recovery time they got less recovery time because it took longer to move per bag. But more importantly, when you calculated it, when we, when we collected the data over a five hour period, for this chart, the blue lines were the um, vacuum lifter and the yellow and brown and gray lines were without the vacuum lifter. So you see the cumulative load throughout a five hour period was significantly higher between, for the workers, the three lines that are blue, the three workers that were using the vacuum lifter compared to the three or four workers that weren't. So when we showed them this, it was pretty solid evidence to say, yes, the vacuum lifter removes the weight per bag, but it actually increases the risk in so many other areas. Fatigue monitoring was another one where we collected data from workers to building a displays in supermarkets. Same two workers, same display, but early in the day, you can see the movement patterns were, this was, the, these charts show the orientation or the the, um, the amount of flexion in the back, the amount of bending that was occurring in the back. So early in the day when they were doing a lift, there wasn't as much bending, a trunk flexion. They were using their legs a lot more. Whereas as the day went on, later in the day, there was a lot more flexion, a lot less legs involved in the lift, which increases the risk of um, back injuries. So collecting the data and assessing their specific movements at the beginning of the day compared to the end of the day for this particular worker was a matter of, how can we identify a way to alert them that they are now fatigued and moving in a different way? And that's where we built one of the features, which was an alert that prompted them when they moved in a way that increased their risk to stop and change the way they're moving. But this particular worker had no idea that he was moving in a way he thought he was lifting the same way that he was at the um, beginning of the day. So as I said earlier, it's not just about reducing. So when I was talking about the acute chronic ratio, it's not just about reducing the load, it's about monitoring and managing the load and avoiding the peaks and troughs. So this particular chart shows a training load of a well-known um, Australian track and field athlete who would regularly break down in the troughs. So you've got these peaks and troughs of their training. 
So you would think in the recovery or reducing the load would reduce the injury risk. But in fact, if there are too many troughs, there's deconditioning so that when there's a peak, they're less resilient to that load and they break down. So this same principle can be taken to the workplace. If you're measuring the worker's movement and you're noticing that there's peaks and troughs, that's when there's injury risk. Going back to one of those charts earlier where there were big columns in some hours and little columns in other hours, if you can manage the load so the peaks and troughs aren't as high and aren't as low, then the body builds that resilience and it's less likely to um, less likely to sustain an injury and break down. But the question is, what is the optimal load? So it's a matter of establishing baselines for each occupation, each task, each location, and that just comes from collecting data. So this was the final thing that we added to the, the product was a way of collecting all of the data, establishing occupation specific baselines, and then judging workers on those baselines. So for a task, it would be the best way of doing it and judging whether workers are doing it with higher load than the best way. But with the, with the chronic load, it was about the average, occupation average. If you're above occupation average for the chronic load, then there's ways that you can reduce that load and bring that, that average down. So this, this chart shows there is this optimal zone, the, the green zone, where optimal loading reduces injury risk, but this is more performance and training load for an athlete. It's exactly the same as the workplace. Then finally, we reassess and refine. So it's that constant managing, and I mean, just recently, we've reassessed and refined the process to add safety training because there's less face-to-face -face, um, interaction with safety professionals and workers. So now we've built in a feature that delivers safety training to the workers through their app. There's another one we've built a new feature for the office workers where if you slouch, if you're in one position for too long, then you get an alert. And if you get too many alerts, it prompts you to do an ergonomic workstation assessment. So it's a matter of now of, of constantly getting feedback from the users looking at the problems and whether the problems are being solved or whether new problems are appearing and reassessing and refining the product. And that's it. So we'll go to the questions. I uh, hope you enjoyed the session and I hope we've got some, um, some good questions. Thank you very much, Scott. That was uh, very interesting, especially to hear about the D um, conditioning of an employee. I think we're all used to being uh, used to getting rid of the risk and taking away those stresses and strains that we might get. But I didn't really consider before hands that that can also decondition you and make you perhaps more susceptible. So it's fantastic that you're uh, monitoring that to be able to prevent those injuries. And also the clever and innovative ways that you engage with the wearers of the, the gadgets. Like you say, it's often good to collect the data, but that can often be seen as uh, collecting too much data. So using the fact that you're uh, involving the sports stories and the sports heroes to kind of show that it's the same technology. I think that's a really clever way of doing things. Well, it's great. We have uh, time now for some questions from the floor. We've got quite a few coming in, uh, so I'll go through some of these. Obviously, we can't get through all of them, unfortunately. Uh, but the first one, Zignu asks, with regards to the project budget, do the employers consider the cost savings of these exercises against the cost of implementing uh, the analysis? Over to you, Scott. Um, thanks, Dylan. So a lot of that varies from, um, from project to project and from employer to employer, but uh, it comes down to whoever is running the project and what their insurance um, insurance situation is, whether they are self-insured or whether they are under a policy. And a lot of the time the brokers and the insurers are the ones who actually control the claims, control the WHS, um, the workers' comp claims anyway. And that, that's generally reflected in the WHS budget. So a bigger budget is often, um, is often allocated for industries and, and occupations where there are a lot of injuries and those injuries are reflected in the workers' compensation premiums and claims. Thank you, Scott. Uh, moving on to uh, John asked the question with regards to analysis, and you mentioned this, the kind of the models for the algorithms that you use. 
are there any standard models for the algorithms or are they something that you've had to kind of design yourself? Yeah, so they're something that we've spent five years refining. So like I said, different sports have different algorithms depending on the variables. So I took the, the years of experience I had in on, and seeing which variables were relevant, which physical demands of the sports. And then we converted them across to all of the data that we collected during the trial and error phase. So we, with the, the help of Oz Industry, we got a grant and we collected um, data over the three year period. And then we just refined the algorithms. We worked out weightings for different variables. So in some situations, rotation was definitely um, so rotation of the shoulder it was more weighted than rotation of the trunk and that sort of thing. Um, and we correlated that with in injury incidents and risks and, and that's how we got the weighting and the, we, we refined the algorithm to, to a point now where we're still refining it um, slightly, but we think we've got it and most of our um, current users have found that the algorithm worked quite well to measure the physical demands of what the workers are going through. And this is one thing a lot of people look at our variables and say, well, that's a risk rating, but we're trying to steer away from risk ratings and hazard scores. And we're trying to just measure the physical demands. And if the physical demands of doing a task, of, of doing a task one way are up here, let's say 300, 350 high risk, high load movements for that task. And another way is a hundred. You can pretty clearly see that you want to try to encourage the workers to do it the way that there's a hundred high load movements as opposed to 300. So we're using it as a measure of the physical demands rather than a, a risk rating or a risk factor. Thank you, Scott. Uh, Karen asks, how do you identify those specific variables for a particular work task? Is that something you, you would go into the workplace and analyze to, to find out what are the important things to be monitoring? Yeah, well, it came back to, as I said in the presentation, it came back to time and the accelerometer data, which was the way the workers moved. So in a workplace, you could have a specific task where a certain amount of force is required to be generated to perform a task. So early on we were measuring the force and we'd measure the force doing tasks different ways, but then we found that you could get 10 different workers who were required to generate that force and they'd all move biomechanically in different ways to generate it. So that's why we thought, well, we wanna measure how these workers are moving to generate the force, not necessarily the force itself. So that's where it's the accelerometer data, which was crucial in identifying the differences in the way the workers moved. So it's the accelerometer variables and time, because over time, fatigue is a big component. So measuring the accelerometer, measuring the workers' movements um, progressively over throughout a full shift um, and throughout a task, those are the key variables. Great, uh, a question from Frank. Generally, how long uh, is a, a worker expected to wear one of the monitoring devices? They look very neat and inobtrusive, but yes, question on uh, how long would they be expected to wear it? Uh, good question. Um, we generally get them to, we collect data over specific tasks. So that's where any worker can wear it for up to three minutes. So that's where you can collect video and data for the specific task. And that's that acute load that I was talking about. But with regards to chronic load and especially the feedback, because there's those alerts that can provide the, the worker with feedback while they're throughout the shift when they're performing the task. We've found that five days tends to be the, the maximum. That's that, that sweet spot because less than five days, we don't really get a true picked up. But more than five days, the alerts become background noise and it becomes a bit more of a chore rather than a novelty and, and we lose the impact. So the workers are less engaged with the data they're receiving and the feedback from the devices. So we found that five days, 10 days max is the absolute limit. We've got a project at the moment with um, one of the, the, in New South Wales, one of the major, um, well, the, the state government major insurer broker and they, the project involves the workers wearing the sensors every day for nine months. And we're now two months into it and the workers, are, are they're sick of it, they're over it. So we're now sort of restructuring that. We're looking at different ways of trying to engage the workers again. So yeah, five five days seems to be the, um, the perfect amount for the workers to wear it, to get an idea of that cumulative load or the chronic load. Great, thank you. And a question from Don relating to the actual accelerometers themselves. Do they respond to a zero frequency, i.e inclination. Um, so I'm guessing is the angle that the worker is at when they're performing an activity, 
taken into account uh, as part of the algorithms, so the actual angle of the bending, for example? Yes, yes, definitely. So we've got, we use the accelerometer gyro, we use the magnetometer, but we use the, the device to basically, we use gravity as our reference point. And so every measurement is angle to vertical, angle to gravity. And the reason being early on, so you could basically, you could be working at this angle of the shoulder, so 90 degrees of the shoulder joint whilst you're standing upright. And that's considered a hazardous task because the load on the shoulder joint is high relative to gravity. Whatever your, your, the weight of your arm and whatever objects are in your hand, increase the load on the shoulder joint. However, you could be bending at 90 degrees and your arm, so basically reaching forward and touching your toes, your shoulder joint is still at 90 degrees, but the load through the shoulder is completely different because of the line of gravity. So the angle to vertical is actually more crucial at, at measuring the load on the joints than the angle of the joints themselves. So yeah, we measure, we, we focused very early on, very early, well, when we started this, we measured everything, joint angles of everything, and we realized that it's not so much the joint angle, you could have someone lying on their back, working above their, working sort of up above them, and it's the angle of the joint relative to gravity that's the key compared to if they're standing up and, and working in front of them. Great, thank you. And a question from Wendy. I'm not sure I've got all the information on this question, so I might have to add a little bit in. I hope I don't break the context of it. Uh, but with regards to COVID-19 and the return to work, can you see that there is more of a place for using the monitoring devices uh, to help people back into work? I'm guessing it's through that deconditioning that we spoke about. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. So, I mean, there's, there's the two pieces of the puzzle. First of all, with the social distancing, there's a lot less scope for the training methods and for safety professionals to actually spend time with workers and deliver safety training. So developing a remote way of measuring the risk and identifying and then addressing the risk through sensors and through a smartphone technology and AI, it's, it's perfect. But then the other side of the coin is, yes, if we can identify the sensors and the algorithms can identify when workers are fatiguing because basically their movement, the control of movement decreases. So if a worker has come back from a period of deconditioning, a period of, at home, and they've come back to, or they're starting to come back to full duties, the data collected can identify which workers are actually responding to those physical demands better than others, which ones are fatiguing quicker than others. And that way you can actually come in and address that by monitoring and managing their workload according to their fatigue rates. Yeah, great question. Uh, a question from Mahinda on, has there been any work on utilising the data to maybe assess people's mental stress with regards to how they may be moving in the workplace, which may be a, an indicator to some form of mental stress? Um, no, it is an area that I've got a lot of interest in. I've researched a lot. There is a strong correlation between workplace injuries and psychosocial components. There all, there's been a lot of research saying that there, there's always a correlation, a lot of workplace injuries, especially workplace injuries that take a long time to recover, there is a psychosocial component. Um, so what we're now starting to explore, we've got a few consultants who are uh, occupational psychologists or behavioral psychologists who are actually gonna help us build questions into the app that the worker can answer throughout the year at certain times throughout the year, basically trying to assess that mental stress or the mental overload so that we can pick that up and tie that in. It's not, it's not directly related to the physical movements as far as we know, but if we start tying, putting those questions there, questionnaires out there and, and having a look at the answers and then correlating those answers back to the physical movements, maybe we will see something, but um, it is definitely something that we know it's linked. So it's something we want to address um, at some point in the future. Thank you. Interesting. Uh, question from uh, John Paul. Uh, kind of a question. I think it's general ask for information. Uh, John's showing that the, his company is obviously concerned in the costs of implementing such a study uh, in the workplace. And they're obviously interested in doing that for the benefit of their employees. But the cost is a big concern. Is there a kind of a case study or information available to show how much money can be saved by an organization for implementing some of these methods that might help 
with the process to engage the employer to, to go ahead with a study. Yeah, definitely. We've got a lot of case studies and we've got a lot of um, a lot of those. It's, it's tricky because workers' compensation premiums and costs are top secret. Most companies won't reveal those, but we've got definitely, we've got um, projects where companies were going to spend this amount on a new piece of equipment and instead they spent money on our project, demonstrated that piece of equipment's not going to be valid and they saved money that way. Uh, but we, uh, from day one, we wanted to make sure that what we were building was cost effective for everyone. So we do pilots, five week pilots for $1,800, but we also once, I mean, there's no point in doing a pilot if it's not cost effective ongoing, but the ongoing solution is $5 per month per worker. So we've got it to the point where it can deliver safety training and deliver the, it's not just the manual handling training and, and information from the sensors. As I said before, you can do all sorts of wellness questionnaires through the app. You build a scoring system. You can have you can have challenges. You can have teams. So, so we built it so that it's a comprehensive solution. It's not just a wearable technology, and it's cost effective. Thank you, Scott. Uh, one final question from Francis: uh, How do the devices connect to the phone to uh, download the data, and how do you charge them up? So it's Bluetooth, um, BLE 5.0 is the streaming. So the sensors stream data to the, the smartphone. If they lose connection, then they store data and then transfer it later. And then just charge through um, a USB micro at the moment. We're going to look at USB-C ports. Uh, well, actually, the manufacturer's already started um, integrating USB-C ports. So it's, it's very simple. And the accelerometers themselves, the hardware themselves, is very basic. It's not rocket science. The key was basically getting the battery life and the well the, the battery life and the BLE streaming to be efficient enough to last a full shift. So we got it to the point where they can last almost sixteen hours. Most shifts are eight to ten hours. So um yeah, that's that's how the, the sensors work and that's how we refine them over the years. Thank you, Scott. That's great. Well, ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that we've come to the end of tonight's presentation on wearable technology. I hope that you found it uh, both interesting and informative. May I take this opportunity to thank you all for attending and also submitting those great questions that we have had. And also like to acknowledge the work of everyone involved from the joint institutions who have helped um, it make it possible tonight. And of course, Scott for his wonderful presentation and his uh, assistant, Amy, again, working behind the scenes to bring these to you. Please be sure to check out our event pages and social media networks and also YouTube channel for further events. A recording of this event will be made available on the Joint Institutions Lecture Series YouTube channel in a couple of days. So please look out for that by searching for Joint Institutions Lecture Series on YouTube. Also, Engineers Australia have a great uh, web platform, EA On Demand, which is accessible to the members and contains many recordings from previous events. So please look for that as well on the, on the EA portal. So really, again, for me, it's just we hope that you enjoyed uh, the event. You'll be able to join us again soon, hopefully in our new auditorium in the centre of Sydney, once that becomes available and the restrictions are reduced. And, but until then, thank you again. Please have a pleasant evening and stay safe wherever you are. Good night.